Thank you all for joining us for this session entitled Weather Report. We are very happy you could be with us today as part of the 1455 Summer Festival hosted by the 1455 Literary Arts. Megan, it's an honor to have this time to chat with you. Um, thank you to 1455 Summer Festival for creating the space to talk about art and the weather and the land that we share. Um, I wanna start the conversation, Megan. I hope it's okay with you. I was reading your essay in Audubon, um, Seeking Home Aboard the Night Heron, and I thought it was so incredibly lovely as a, a way to start this conversation and, and really talk about the migratory birds that we are as writers. Um, is it okay if I quote from it, Megan? Of course, yes, that's great, and thank you. It takes a certain determination to stay tethered to the lives and places that matter to you, to steer full self into the divine chaos knowing that it will change on you as soon as you have your bearings. Migratory birds know this instinctually, and yet each year they change the voyages between their different homes. I was reading that, Megan, and thinking about the fact that in our work, probably, and it sounds like in our lives too, you and I are both sort of migratory birds, aren't we? Um, and it, it makes sense to me. I've never been able to just call one place home. I feel like I'm always untethered and happily moving between places and, and constantly updating my bio about where I'm from and where I live. And so maybe building on that, I'd love to hear about the Night Heron Project a bit and, and your next book, um, and maybe you'll read for it from us a bit. Yes, thank you. And, and thanks to everyone um, there for inviting us to hold forth about you know, weather, books, climate and and your question just gets right to the heart of something I think I've been circling in my work for the last decade that I've been publishing, which is a notion of home and and connection to place, which I think humans and animals share just that sort of orientation and that biochemical emotional response, physical response to to place. And I think when I first started writing, I realized that, I had um, a bigger increased respect for instinct as an animal myself. I think it, there was something about motherhood. There was something about leaving the South where I'd spent the first 30 years of my life and moving to a farm in Vermont where I just had a lot of um, a whiplash going on and, and I was processing that through my work. And the Night Heron Project, I bought a boat, <laughs> which is a funny sentence to say. Um, because it was something I'd always wanted to do. So I'm sure you have one of these too, Melissa, but just like one of those old core dreams, like something that you've been holding on to that, you know, despite yourself, despite logic, despite, you know, rational thinking that you, you might just do, um, and, and buying a boat and being able to spend more time on the water down south was that for me. Because living in Vermont for the last 12 years, I still feel a little bit like an exotic species. And my friend J. Drew Lanham writes so beautifully about the loaded language about, you know, it, what, what is a native species? What is an exotic species? Who belongs where? But every winter in Vermont, I have this moment where I think, not here, not me. <laughs> I never meant to end up on a cold New England farm. Um, and yet, as, as time goes by, I'm also connected to this place. And, and I'm sure you can relate to that too. So buying the boat was... Um, about establishing a connection to my old core self, checking the box of an old dream and just getting back to place, to home, I guess, as nuanced as that is. And how would you, how would you describe your nuanced sense of home? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think I'm a migrant. I think I am a person, a nomad. I move between and try to make a home wherever I am as well. Um, I grew up in a floodplain. So I, and I didn't know that that was always going to infuse my work, but there's always water in my work and my characters are always watching it because they know not to trust it. And yet they're also trying to always wrestle it and control it. And that's a theme through all of my work because of course it's futile to try to control the environment or imagine that we're in charge of it. So there's all these, um, always metaphors, but even now that I live on the East Coast, mid-Atlantic, very, very stable weather region, I still check the weather and the, the lakes, the rivers. Every time I travel, I need to know where safe passage is. Like, how do you get out of this space? And also, is there a tornado coming? Um, because that violent weather, the way that you're always aware of weather is always in my work too. 
Um, so I, I think like you, I, I, I am aware of my place in the world and it, and it runs pretty deep in my roots. Will you read for us, Megan, from, from, your, from the book that's about to come out? Absolutely. I, I chose one of the stories that, um, you know, actually relates to, to the West, which is actually not a place that I'm familiar with, but I'm thinking about this, this thing you just brought up, which is vigilance, this sort of um, hyper awareness or attunement to weather conditions, which I feel like I grew up with on the coast in Eastern North Carolina, this sort of hurricane awareness. And then in Vermont, I'm constantly monitoring the weather because of snow and storms. And, um, you know, this, this story that I'm about to read, I'm, I guess I'm really interested in writing about the way place and weather add pressure mm -hmm. um, to situations, to characters' lives. And I think we're all experiencing that and will continue to experience that henceforth. But I try not to let that suck up all the oxygen in a story, you know, to still put characters first. Um, so I'm just going to read a few pages of, of a short story called Heirloom that's coming out in the Sewanee Review, I think this fall. So I'll read a few pages of that. This is the heirloom. Keenan pushed open the door to the underground bunker, a cloud of sickeningly hot Arizona air following him. His white t-shirt was streaked with red dust and grease coated his fingers. He'd been fixing the excavator before the next round of guests arrived at the ranch. Close the door, Reagan said, grimacing from where she was sitting cross-legged on the bed enjoying the subterranean cool. It was dark inside and simply furnished with a desk, kitchenette, a table and chairs. Her mother's art made of stark white bones was the only decoration. The white walls brought light. There were a few rooms in the above ground portion of the earth house, but they were hot and better in winter. They're ready for you, Keenan said, a van full of hedge fund guys. Reagan nodded. In truth, the hedge funders were her favorite customers. They were clueless about how to operate a bucket loader and her authority became absolute in minutes. It was delicious to feel the power dynamics turn when she buckled men into the bright orange heavy machinery and turned them loose on their childhood fantasies. Keenan cleaned his glasses with the bottom of his shirt. He was tall and wiry and he came closer to the bed and stood over her. Are you heading into town? She asked, closing her computer. She'd been fumbling through the quarter's accounting, wondering if she'd been withholding enough for taxes. She hadn't. Thought I'd close my eyes for a few, he said. He kicked off his boots and flopped onto the bed next to her. She cringed, thinking of how dirty he was. She wanted him to shower, but they had to watch their water usage. Water was trucked onto the ranch once a week. Reagan had a solar shower installed behind the barn, a small sack of spare water you could use to rinse yourself clean. As long as you get the new cars by tonight. I'll get the cars. Keenan was already fading. In a final act, he pulled his visor free from his curly auburn hair and threw it to the floor. His breathing slowed. Must be nice, she thought, to sleep so easily, so soundly. Every week, Keenan was in charge of selecting eight cars from the DUI crash lot and getting them back to the ranch. Reagan didn't like fooling with the men at the lot, so she sent Keenan, who was getting better at picking out cars that still had some life left cars that felt satisfying to crunch with an excavator. She patted Keenan's leg. A year before, she might have kissed him or rolled on top of him momentarily. She pulled her hair up into a quick bun, ran a sunscreen stick over her cheeks and nose, and left the bunker. As soon as she stepped outside, the heat bore down on her. She'd installed a shade system, a network of triangular cuts of sailcloth, artfully pulled over the path between the earth house and the big dig arena but sailcloth was no match for the 110 degree day. She waved to the hedge fund team, four men in crisp shorts, who ironed shorts, with their arms folded over their chests, expectant in their power poses. She liked when they started this way, confident and a little put out. It gave her something to work with, something to break down. The men stood in a line, gazing in awe at the circular fenced in arena where five large machines were parked in various stations. There were piles of dirt, stacks of giant tires, and an obstacle course set up. Grab a Gatorade from the cooler, Reagan barked. Water won't cut it out here in the sun. The men turned and crouched to fish through the tin cooler. When Reagan had first started the business on the ranch, she realized she was too nice. She felt as though the men didn't listen to her, and everyone was at risk using heavy equipment when they didn't listen. She'd finally taken an online power dynamics course with the dominatrix and learned how to wield her power. Weird, maybe, but it worked. 
Everyone is still caught up in their mommy and daddy issues, the dominatrix said. You have to play one or the other. Reagan now knew to take up space with a wide stance, to keep her words slow and minimal. She never started out with warmth or provided personal information about herself. There are four stations, she said, beginning her talk, pointing to each station as she went. You can stack tires with a skid steer. You can dig a hole with the mini excavator, or you can choose the bulldozer course. If that's not enough, for $800, you can crush a car with a big excavator. The men looked at each other. $800 was nothing to them. It was a lot to her. It meant fuel for the machines, salaries for three staff, Gatorade in the cooler, food in the cupboard. What's crushing a car like, you ask, she said, putting a hand on her hip. It's better than therapy. Some say it's better than sex, but I think that depends on your level of skill. She let the ambiguity hang in the dry air. The men shifted, and she wondered what their eyes looked like behind their expensive sunglasses. She could hear the cactus wren calling from the brush. It sounded like an engine trying to turn over. Now I want to talk to you about safety. Reagan walked over to the big bucket loader and climbed in. She flipped the ignition, and the machine came to life. She swung the big yellow arm around in a dramatic arc, flipped up a beach ball from the ground, and landed it in the center of a tire. She slid out of the driver's seat and walked back toward the men whose faces had slackened a little. She had their attention. One man, the tallest, clapped. This is a place where you can work out your feelings. You can break things. You can feel the primal power of a big machine at your fingertips. But you must be precise, and you must be safe. Otherwise, you're out. Understand? The men nodded. I will pull you from the machine if I think you're a danger to yourself or others. She was playing mommy now. They clapped each other on the back. Let's do this, one said. You'll watch a 10-minute safety video inside the gift shop, Reagan said, slowly and in a low voice. Sam will get you started. Sam was a 250-pound former tight end who drank a lot of tequila and was uncanny with machines. He wore gas station aviator glasses, and his sweaty, muscular arms shone when he worked outside in the sun. He kept his blonde hair shaved. He was deferential to her, sweeter than he looked. Sam played piano, mostly Elton John covers, and had a small fawn-colored chihuahua named Lucy Diamonds who rode shotgun in his turquoise pickup. Let me establish power first in the introductions, she told him early on. Got it, boss, he'd said, and he had. Reagan knew if she didn't talk first, the men naturally turned their attention to Sam. Somehow, despite her initial suspicions, Sam was one of the few men who really seemed to understand her need for authority. He stayed out of the picture until the safety video and she silently thanked him for it. The gift shop was a bright orange shipping container with spotty air conditioning, a composting toilet, and one rack of t-shirts that read, ask me about my big dig. Reagan wasn't proud of those, but they sold well. Lucy Diamond slept in a small fleece bed underneath the counter, the tip of her pink tongue hanging out. As long as she was asleep, she couldn't see anyone, and if she couldn't see anyone, she wouldn't bark. She had faith that Sam would come for her at the end of each day scooping her up in the safety of his big arms. While the men sat on the wooden bench watching the video, Reagan took them in. Always better to watch than be watched, especially when you are a five foot two, 29 year old woman trying to launch a business geared toward thwarted little boys with a man's disposable income. Reagan worked to identify her victim, the one on whom she'd forced the family heirloom ploy. Either she or Keenan would toss in a faded bronze war medal into one of the holes in progress and stop everything only pretend to pretend that the customer had found the long lost treasure. The family heirloom was in fact an old war medal she'd purchased on eBay. She didn't feel that bad about the deception. Her clients were basic rich men, golfers, just short of six feet tall, with the same clean cut hair, who wore Brooks Brothers shorts and a Rolex or a Breitling. And she liked the look of the tall one who'd applauded her party trick with the bucket loader, the one whose knee was bouncing as he watched the video. He seemed vulnerable, responsive, almost emotionally available. He probably had daughters at home or had done some therapy. What's your name? One of them turned to ask her. The dominatrix taught Reagan one essential rule of power. Always answer a question with a question. Why do you need to know? He shrugged his shoulders. Reagan, she said, offering her hand. Reagan love. She squeezed his hand as hard as she could and he let go first, just right. Reagan love, he asked incredulous. He was clearly too stupid or lazy to think about all the time she'd endured the same joke. Was your mom a diehard Republican? She didn't answer him. That was another trick she'd learned. You simply stopped responding to a conversation you no longer wanted to have. Plus, her mother had been far from a diehard Republican. She was a second wave feminist, 
with a lot of purple sweatsuits and no bra on the weekends, suspicious of men, but nervous about extremism of any kind. Can't we all just get along and drink a glass of Zinfandel, she liked to say. When the safety video finished, Reagan had the finance guys sign their waivers, listen to their cliche jokes about needing their lawyers to read it first, and let Sam lead the men to their different stations. She waved to Keenan in the distance and he waved back the dry hills and low scrubby brush behind him. He was walking to the Jeep en route to select the impounded cars. He shoved his hands back into his pockets. His gait was long and goofy. He always seemed so young compared to these other men. What she needed in a man right now was different from what she wanted. Or did everyone go to bed feeling that way? Everything was so stilted now, so heavy with work and the world. I'll stop there. Oh, that's so wonderful, Megan. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciated that so much of it was about power dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, I think in many ways, when we write about the natural world and, and the weather, right, that we were talking about earlier around us, we're, we're calibrating, we're recalibrating our own individual place, right, on the planet. And the planet's changing and we have to adapt to that. Yet humans, they want control, right? And change is hard. Um, but I think when readers and writers are paying attention to that natural world, to the environment, to climate change, to the impact of our human consumption, um, you can see that we're just, we're fighting a losing battle for power with the natural world. And so many of those power dynamics are reflected in that piece. Um, I can't wait to read the rest of the collection. Thank you. Yeah, it's, the idea is just that she's inherited a farm from her mother, a ranch from her mother that has suddenly lost all water. So it's completely dry. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, like you're saying, it really is about power dynamics, weather pressing in and, and just the compression. And um, also important to me to show work lives affected mm -hmm. by weather, um, because I think, I just think that matters a lot. And it's often left out of, perhaps it's because I didn't grow up in New York City, but sometimes when I read some types of fiction, I just think, well, some people work. <laughs> um, and so I'd like to represent that. You know. That, that makes sense to me. I write about class as well. And uh, it, is, it is sometimes surprising to people um, to consider what labor means, mm -hmm. what leisure means, um, and that there's, that most of America doesn't have leisure, we have labor. Right, beautifully mm -hmm. said. Um, are you gonna share um, some of your work? Yeah, um, so the book that's most recently out is my second novel, it's called The Hive. And uh, it's a, I think it's, it's right there, Megan, look, it's right there. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's a story about class, as we were discussing in America. And there's four sisters and a family business, and it's set in a politically divided Midwestern town. So the Feller family provides a, a working class lens on kind of a messy family facing the recession. And I think when we talk about place, we also talk about setting. And I, I always knew that this story was going to be set in 2008 because I wanted to look up at the recession in middle America and, and acknowledge the way that growing fear, resentment, and what I experienced in 2008 leading up to it was a lot of blame on Obama really laid a foundation for the election eight years later, which uh, as a, now that I live in Washington DC on the East Coast, it seemed to surprise many people. And yet those of us, I think from middle America or those of us from working class backgrounds were not surprised at all. Uh, we were more shocked that people were shocked. And so I knew that this story and this, the Feller family story was also going to talk about the radicalism that we see today. Like, how did we get here? So Robbie, um, who's the patriarch of the family, this is not giving anything away, but because it says it on the book jacket. So he's um, definitely the most problematic member of the hive. And he longs for a past that's that's you know really about power dynamics that, that we were talking about earlier. And he um, he liked the world the way it was. And he resists that change because he fears that, it, that the new world won't serve him. And so Robbie's sudden death in the beginning of the novel makes room for the five women in the family to, to grow from, from their grief. So I'll read to you, I think just from the beginning of, from the beginning of the hive, because I wanna talk about setting and I wanna talk about the way that this fellow family fish camp, um, I grew up on the banks of the Mississippi River and everyone, 
who can has a, a fish camp, which sounds very elite on the East Coast, but is really just a, a trailer on stilts, um, close enough to the water that you can throw a line in. So I, I wanted the family, Feller Family Fish Camp to really be the foundation of, of, um, of where they have been raised from. So I'll start by introducing you to the sisters and to the fish camp. It was mid-July on a sweltering Missouri afternoon and the sun couldn't find a single cloud to hide behind. Waterfowl ducked beneath the river's surface and whippoorwills sang their melancholy from lush trees waving above. The stale air stank of soil and algae mixed with coconut sunscreen. The muddy water of the Mississippi River wasn't worried with the Feller family's survival, but the sisters were. Sunshine baked the wooden dock and kissed the Feller sisters' freckles. And just as they had the summer before and the one before that one too, the sisters wore bikinis, faded tops and bottoms passed down and among them. The river assaulted the elastic and the blistering light faded the floral colors, but still camp swimwear endured. It came too close for me, Tammy said, dangling her legs off the dock. We almost lost everything. She flexed her feet in the sticky air. A rotten piece of debris hung from her pinky toe. Tammy shook it off and the current swept it away. Everything that mattered anyway. It was never that close, Maggie insisted. She swatted a mosquito on Tammy's thigh, leaving a thin trail of crimson bug blood. Besides, nobody would want this old fishing camp. It's a mess. But it's our mess, Kate said, looking up and down her row of sisters. It was too close for mom, Jules added. She was itching to be done with it all. The family business and the business of the family, all of it. At least we're still together, Maggie said. That's what dad cared about. Sipping green glass bottles of soda, the sisters agreed, but they'd never know the true feelings of their father. One year ago, they'd sat on the same dock, months before their family broke, and they were left with only the fragments of the hole they'd once been. Now they were making their first camp trip solo as sisters. They were still sorting out who brought what and how the family worked now. Jules dove into the brown water alone and waded her way back up. Maggie and Tammy held hands, nudging each other's hips and jumped off the dock together. Kate ran at her sisters and waited in vain for her parents to call after them and then belly flopped in the middle of their wake with a splash. The Feller family fish camp had been handed down for three generations, a burden both beloved and neglected. It was a simple single wide trailer on stilts with rusted panels that had maybe once been painted white. The camp sat at the meeting of the mighty Mississippi and the Ohio River on the lap of Fort Defiance Park. Robbie, their dad, liked to remind them all it was once called Camp Defiance during the Civil War and had been commanded by General Ulysses S. Grant. Jules would roll her eyes and tell him that glorifying a war fought for slavery was oppressive. Before they began their banter about erasing history versus righting historical wrongs, Grace, their mother, would hold up her hand and say, enough. By the time they loaded the car for these trips, Grace had made dozens of decisions. She sought a truce, even if it wouldn't hold. The trailer's living room and kitchen combination reeked of rancid catfish and bitter beer. The two miniature bedrooms housed four sets of built-in bed bunks with narrow strips of peeling dingy vinyl between the lofts. The fellers ran to camp most summer weekends and squeezed in a few fall trips before the chill arrived and the leaves crisped in the Missouri Valley. At camp, the sisters learned to bait hooks, pull fish traps, fun muck, and dig burrs out of their bare feet. They knew which bunks were theirs because they'd carved their names in the frames as a tradition on their fifth birthdays. On their annual inaugural trip, as spring rounded the corner to summer, Grace cut notches in the wooden stairs to measure her daughter's growth. She added their initials and the date while the sisters raced ahead, peeling off Catholic school uniforms and pulling on mismatched swimsuit pieces from a communal wicker basket before jumping off the dock into the cool relief of the muddy water. The dog chased them, cautioning their courage with a bark and cheering on their unleashed animal freedom. The promise of the camp brought hope. It lifted the family spirits to pile in the car after the last day of school and travel toward the water. Each trip, the Feller family wished they would roast marshmallows for s'mores and finally catch fireflies without fighting over which sister had more. They would leave the family pest control business behind and not talk about how to cover the quarterly tax bill or whether they should pay for their employees' cell phones. But first, they had to drive the 46 miles from Cape Girardeau, Missouri to Cairo, Illinois, snaking the Mississippi River's gritty coast to put in the boat. Each trip, Robbie insisted they coordinate bathroom breaks for the drive, but they had to stop at least twice. Even as they grew from children to teens to young adults, their trips were the same. Maggie would say they should have checked the road conditions, 
Jules got carsick. Someone else would say planning took away from the adventure, probably Tammy. Kate didn't say much. She was lost in her own thoughts and passed around their mom's latest creation of homemade granola bars. Their brindle pit bull nacho would whine from the back seat and lick their hands for crumbs. Robbie promised that if they could all just hold it, they'd be cooking hot dogs over a fire in time for supper. But they usually settled for grilled cheese sandwiches on the dock as the sun set. Nacho ran after the bunnies in the bushes, hoping to find his own dinner, relieved to be released from the car. Who knew which family camp trip would be the one they'd remember the most? The pieces of the weekends and years might add up to an entirely different story. Maybe they'd each remember separate parts or the same ones in different patterns. Perhaps as grief and joy intersected, they'd learn that the whole mattered more than the portions. Nacho could have told them that. Dogs know that the only mat moment that matters is the one you're living. I think I'll stop there. I loved um, these moments of tension that you had, like the camp being both loved and neglected, the continuum of grief and joy, and just the atmospheric nature of, of sinking into place and giving, you know, giving it real descriptive energy, but in a way that's so active, like we feel the characters in the space, but I love the rancid canfish, catfish detail and the vinyl and the piece of debris on the foot. Um, but it's always nice to feel characters inhabit a space and, and feel their, their familiarity and their love and their hate of a place, just the way it's pressing in on them. I really felt that. Um, it makes me Go ahead, sorry, Megan. Well, I was just gonna ask, um, just because there seems to be this level of familiarity with the place, you know, I, I'm, I'm just guessing, but I, I'm, you know, as you're describing it. And I, I was going to just ask you your, your first awareness of, of place, of weather, your, you know, just what, what made you feel attuned to a place like that, that you were just describing? I, I like that you mentioned awareness because I think that's the real key to it. I don't know when I wasn't, embedded in, affected by, and consumed by the natural world. When you grow up in the country, right? And you grow up near farmland, um, you're always watching weather. You're always aware of place. Um, I grew up in a floodplain and lived on the Mississippi River when it reached a 500 year crest in the summer of 93. And I think leaving my town after that flood was when I first had the awareness that other people don't grow up with flood trauma. Um, our town's flood stage was 16 feet and the river rose to 31.8. So that, when you, when you meet anyone in the world that grew up um, or was aware of the flood of 93, there's a, it's an, it has an effect on them, right? That type of natural disaster and the way it threatens your entire way of being. Um, and yet it's a normal natural cycle for those of us who live in floodplains. And um, downtown Hannibal in particular, which um, has, of course, Mark Twain's boyhood home relies on tourism, was spared in 93 because we put up these um, flood walls, these cement flood walls that permanently blocked our view of the Mississippi River and interrupted our lives, but saved our, our livelihood. So I think that was the very first time that I was aware of this idea of haves and have nots, and that there are people that believe they can protect themselves from the natural world because they can afford to do so. Um, and this is, you know, the history of the Mississippi River is an entire history of have and have nots in our country and uh, of engineering, trying to control water and determine, you know, uh, who gets, who, who is important enough to survive. Um, so I think leaving a floodplain like that and realizing that not everybody carries that with them had a, it had a huge impact on me. What, what about you, Megan? When did you first sort of become aware of the natural world and, and your place in it? Yeah, I love, um, well, I don't love, but I really relate to that sense of brutal calculus, you know, that you were just talking about of, of people trying to control the natural world and the way that can differentiate the haves and have nots. Um, in terms of the Mississippi, I had no sense of that until I read, you know, John McPhee's work on controlling the Mississippi. And I was there in 2019 canoeing part of the Mississippi near Natchez during a flood event. And I, um, I saw exactly what you're saying, just the way it affected. There were these businesses, mostly kind of broken down bars that were, you know, you could you could see the prosperity change, you know, with the, the proximity to um, the floodplain um, and also some ill-advised new building projects. <laughs> but, um, but growing up in the coast of North Carolina, it was exactly what you're describing, just of people who can afford risk, who can afford to mediate the impact of extreme weather. So 
you know, people with second homes and beach homes and the way that people truck in sand or do dredging projects that will affect other less prosperous areas that save, save others. Um, and this sort of intervention that's going to be increasingly expensive and increasingly demanded, it's going to be really interesting to see um, how that plays out both in places where you grew up and places where I grew up. Um, but I think my parents weren't environmentalists. They weren't, you know, they had grown up um, poor in rural Virginia and they were excited to get off the farm. They were excited to get into a new house. They were excited to join the middle class. And so um, growing up, it was really just being outside, being on the beach, growing up in a rural farm oriented agricultural space um, that developed my awareness and familiarity with the natural world. But I don't think it was until I moved to a farm in Vermont where I really started to identify as an environmentalist. Um, just because living on 11 acres, I was just immersed in it in a way that I hadn't been before. Um, and also having children gave me new eyes, I think, um, for what was going on around me and a different level mm -hmm. of concern. Yeah. I think that type of immersion um, is so important for writers um, of just simply being in a place and, and slowing down enough that you can be aware of what's happening around you. One of the real hypocrisies about a floodplain is that once it's flooded, of course, the land is essentially, it looks like the farm is destroyed. This happened to so many. But the truth is, a few years later, the soil is more valuable, right? Because it, it stirs up and moves up all that natural, those resources are redistributed. And so it's such a fantastic metaphor. But in my experience, none of us could hold on to that land. Um, you needed the immediate relief from, you know, from the government to, to survive just the next month. And so the, the danger of, of course, letting go of your land, which becomes more valuable, which is, of course, then bought up by someone who wants to do more factory farming and change the community. Um, I'm sure you've seen that, too, um, in, in some of your research projects and in your immersion also for, for work. Absolutely. For The Guardian, I did a series of pieces on fishing communities and fishing culture, you know, the, the nature of working docks and how those are disappearing because people are developing waterfronts. They don't like the look and feel of a working fishing dock. And also as the ocean waters warm, the fish stocks are moving, livelihoods are changing, and large scale commercial fishing is, you know, kind of overcoming small scale commercial fishing and just the way that changes the look and feel of small towns, culture, livelihoods. Um, have, I feel like, an increased respect for the interconnectedness of everything, which I feel like you're describing mm -hmm. as well. Um, I often find I have to immerse myself in a, in a environment, in a culture, in a community in order to be able to write about it. And um, your, the piece that you read, Megan, where um, she keeps coming in and out of the bunker makes so much sense to me. I mean, I know exactly what that looks like. Um, and part of the research I did for the Hive um, was going to a place called Prepper Camp which is actually down near your parts. It's in North Carolina. Um, are you familiar with this? You're nodding, or maybe you've heard about it. No, I, I have a feeling I'm going to be able to fathom it though, but I, um, I have a secret, maybe not so secret obsession with prep or anything, but okay. <laughs> I'm so, eager to hear. Well, well, so I always start with a question like you did about the fisheries and how it changes the local community. And one of the questions I was asking in the hive is what that line was between preparedness and paranoia. like when you grow up, as we did in rural communities, this idea of preparedness seems very natural. Um, town is far away, there's no grocery store near, you can your food, you grow your corn, you have livestock, you take care of yourself, and, and that somehow seems extremist to, um, to the city dwellers that I live here now by in Washington, DC, um, who, who may not have an extra gallon of water when Hurricane Sandy is coming their way. So I, I wanted to though, try to answer that question. Like, when do you step over from, okay, this is a reasonable amount of preparedness to a type of paranoia that allows folks to other, other humans. So I went to this camp. It's, um, it's in Saluda, North Carolina. Um, it's a three-day wilderness skill building workshop. And um, I thought it was going to be more of a, a gun show or maybe a trade show, but it turned out to absolutely be a survivalist camp. And the, the Feller family I write about in the hive would, would fit in pretty well there. Um, so I learned more about beekeeping and composting and solar energy, things that don't actually sound so extreme now. And I wrote the hive before the pandemic. So many of the things that uh, with preppers that I think we used to think were pretty extreme actually seem pretty mainstream today. 
So um, Grace, the main character in the hive is, she's a survivalist, she wants to live with the land. She wants to, she has one bunker, but wants to build another one out by the Feller family fish camp because you always need a second base to go to in case there really is an apocalypse. Um, but she's crossed that line, right? Um, and she's a fierce mother, she's gonna protect her family, but at what cost? And that I think is the question we're all wrestling with when we're thinking about the world changing and, and how we can protect ourselves from it, um, how we can protect our families from it. There's always, I think, that tension in the natural world. Yeah, I remember reading about the, the billionaire bunkers in New Zealand. Um, and that's a really posh version of what rural folks have been doing for, <laughs> for a long time. And after living in Vermont for 12 years, you know, we have two gardens, an orchard, we put up jam, we freeze vegetables, um, we keep animals, we have hens and eggs. And some of my friends were joking, like they were like, you've been preparing for this pandemic for a long time. But I'm laughing thinking about this question you have about when, when do you walk over the line? And um, my friend and I were joking, we each bought, like panic bought a 30 pound bag of rice. Um, and, and we were like, that was the moment we crossed the line. <laughs> but it was the 30 well, pound bag of rice. If you're willing to open that bag of rice, of course, and have a huge <laughs> party and share it. But many of those things that they sell, like in those kind of quantities are meant for feeding masses of people, not, you know, a family of four. Um, and I, last week I was on 1A with, um, an author who wrote about those bunkers in New Zealand and, and traveled the world actually looking at those high-end bunkers. And also with um, the founder of The Prepared, which is a survivalist website that says it's socially minded, community minded. Um, and so it was an interesting conversation about what prepping really means and, and the dangers really of it. And when it becomes hoarding, when those resources become you know, something that you're not willing to share. Um, and those, those um, high-end bunkers in New Zealand, I have very little patience for. I, I just think it's, it's consumerism at its absolute worst. It's absurdism. Um, so anyway. <laughs> I mean, fear fear is, is something that capitalism can do pretty impressive things with. Um, and I, you know, I, I know that fear and imagination are also linked because I think sometimes, you know, people with a healthy imagination tend to, you know, fear, fear is an act of forward thinking in some ways of anticipation of imagination. And so sometimes I feel those things tied in, you know, in, in maybe some of my own lesser moments, um, but also just in the kind of larger cultural imagination. Mm -hmm. But um, that's, that's really interesting thinking about, um, building a fictional world within that space and, and those pressures and desires and kind of psychological, the psychological profile of someone like that. Mm -hmm. The profile and also acknowledging our own fears, like the way that we live our lives is also about making sure that we're prepared to protect. Um, but you know, what, what, how far will you, are you willing to go? To me, it, it leads to so much tension in the writing on the page because you need the natural world. And yet, you know, um, I, I grew up on a, I grew up in a rural community and my family's in the pest control industry. So there's always this tension between, <clears throat> excuse me, you don't want to destroy something, but your job is to destroy something. Um, and that was part of the research that I was doing for the Feller family um, into the insect world and reading about, you know, reading pest control magazines that I'd grown up with on our coffee tables, but really going back to, to the foundations of those ideas. Like, of course we need pest control because we don't want it in our food supply. There are reasons that we don't want these things in our homes and our food. But on the other hand, when we use chemicals to destroy, we are destroying ourselves. We're destroying the natural world. And it's so true of bees and beekeeping, which is part of why I knew that that had to be um, and, and the, one of my favorite lines, one of my favorite through plot lines in the hive is about bed bugs, which are the best, um, uh, revelations of class because people think bed bugs are, are so threatening, so gross. We don't want them, of course, but the truth is the, the more you can afford your high end bunker in New Zealand, the more likely you are to have bed bugs because they love transportation. And so the more mobile you become, right, um, the actual more likely you are to have bed bugs. Um, so some of that research I thought was, it was so fascinating. And in the Feller family, they learned that heat is the best way actually to control those pests, that chemicals don't work on bed bugs. They keep adapting 
to the chemicals that we try to use on them. And so the only way actually to fight a bed bug population is through enormous heat trailers pulled up to your house and basically you're microwaving your house. And that's, um, so it's fascinating to me that sometimes the agenda or the outcome is something we can agree on, but that the methods that might harm the environment are where the tension is, right? And I think about the, this is probably true where you are as well. Um, I grew up in a family of hunters, right? People hunted all the time and hunters are some of the biggest conservationists I know. They also want to protect the land. They want it there for hunting. Um, and so the, the, the value at the end is, is the same, but the methods for getting there, I think are where the tension comes in. Yeah, it's, um, I, I profiled uh, a few individuals from Ducks Unlimited uh, with that very issue at heart. Just thinking if we are going to address climate change in substantial, meaningful ways, it's going to mean collaborating with people with whom we disagree. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm always interested in, in these, these centers of Venn diagrams that we ignore, where we do have things in common, objectives in common, outcomes in common. But it feels so dangerous to come into conversation with people with whom we know we're going to disagree. Um, and I find that a really rich space that I feel like I want to move more into as a human, um, primarily because I feel like I have, you know, I have changed class in my in my life. I have lived in rural and urban areas, north and south. And so people building bridges, you know, in order to have fruitful discussions is really interesting and important to me. Is that something you relate to just sort of in your life experience and in your work? Absolutely. Um, and one of my intentions with the Hive was to write about this political division and make it so that we could talk about the stories, right? We may not be able to talk about our own personal beliefs, but it is less threatening to sit around a dinner table and, and discuss characters and discuss plot. Um, and that, you know, we all have um, our, our, our own, our, that we often agree uh, on values, but we disagree on the politics to get to, to, to preserve those values. And so I knew that the family that I was writing about had to be politically divided. Um, and I knew that the town was already politically divided. So to me, that is, it's really rich fodder for fiction. Um, it's built in tension, but it also means some very uncomfortable conversations among family members that are, that are sometimes painful to read and experience. Um, but I think it provides enough of a buffer that it perhaps it opens up stories that can help heal that. Um, I think, you know, I always want to read and write about, I mean, even though much of what I write about is, is familiar territory, I always want to read and write about worlds that I don't occupy um, because it gives us space to do so, right? Um, and I know this is also part of the work that you do, Megan, at, at Middlebury. Um, and we're both teachers who write or Maybe we're writers who teach. I'm not sure which it is anymore. It depends on the, the month. <laughs> right, it does. It definitely. There's a cycle to the to the academic year, also, isn't there? Um, will you tell me a little bit more about the Middlebury program and the way that you use it to to raise that kind of awareness about the environment? Sure. Um, so I teach during the year across the literature and environmental studies departments at Middlebury for undergrads, but in the summers I help run the Breadloaf Environmental Writers Conference. And it's a space that I feel like is urgent and exciting um, in terms of, you know, it's sort of nerdy to like this, but I, I like being on the administrative side of it mm -hmm. because I think about what are all the conversations we're not yet having that we could be having um, and, and just cracking open what it means to write about the natural world. I mean, I feel like there was this cliche notion of what an environmental writer looked like. You know, and it was a sort of wealthy white man looking fresh from the Orvis catalog and like a green woolen vest and a bespoke rifle, you know, and, and talking about waving, you know, amber wheat in a field or something. And I, um, he's got a walking stick so he can get through the trails behind Red Loaf. <laughs> that's right. Um, and I, you know, and I know that guy, I know a couple of versions of that guy and I, I love him. Um, and yet I think there's been, there's so many more perspectives, obviously, that are lacking in terms of experiences within the natural world and places, um, frontline communities, marginalized communities, places that don't always get um, to get the byline or have the writing training or have the space to write a novel, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and I love just opening up you know, who gets to picture themselves as an environmental writer. And so when I look at my objective, with the program that's really, that's really part of it. 
yeah what's your what's your teaching life like in terms of balance and well when I'm not dreaming of bread loaf um, yeah. <laughs> um I coordinate our undergraduate creative writing program at American University. And I think even though we're a very much an urban campus, we call ourselves an arboretum because um, we are an actual campus in the middle of the city and with, with this beautiful natural world around us. And, and I think that's DC has so many green spaces and so much they prioritize that. Um, and so we have beehives on all of our rooftops and we are, I think, commercially very aware of the environment. Um, and I think that the, you know, with the pan, the Potomac River is right out our door and Rock Creek Park runs through our campus. So we are aware and familiar with it, but I think it's actually the pandemic that has maybe made us miss campus the most, made us understand those green spaces, made us think about how the natural world affects us in a different way. I'm, I'm curious, we haven't been on campus, so I'm curious to get back in the fall in in-person classes again to see if you know, um, this type of slowing down and paying attention um, has affected us. I know it's affected me and I've sat at this desk now for over a year and I didn't know the, the birds outside my window before and I do now. Um, I didn't, you know, I hadn't mapped all the perennials this is one of the projects we did last summer is I have a very old, I live in a very old house and the woman who owned the house and had it for 50 years um, had this map of all the perennials that she planted over the years and they bloom and they're beautiful, but I don't know that I'd really paid much attention and, and my kids and I had time to pay attention to those perennials and I kept taking photos and sending them to her to let her know what was blooming now and I understood for the first time that she had actually planned them and, and the annuals to come up at a certain time. And I was aware in a different way of the world around me because of the time and space to do so. Um, so um, I'm wondering if that will you know, come into our teaching even more. Um, you know, I've always done teaching in which we go outside of the classroom and, and sit in a, a space that's uh, more open to the world. But I'm curious how that will affect my students writing now that we've all lived through this and become perhaps more aware. Um, I don't know yet. Um, and I know Breadloaf was, was online as well. The environmental one was online, wasn't it? It was, it was, it's really strange to do such a place-based conference online, uh, but I was so pleased with the conversations that it started and, and, and what it meant in terms of access, you know, if, you know, people could get to a Zoom lecture or a remote workshop, you know, working mothers or people that can't afford travel or time off could make this work in a way they couldn't before. So that was a surprising upside, but I also can't wait to be walking green fields with bobolinks, you know, singing and walking through the woods with a naturalist and learning about ferns, you know, all that sort of stuff that I pick up when I'm there. But I'm, I'm relating to what you said about knowing your property. I mean, I would have told you before the pandemic that I did, but the depth has just increased. You know, I started an evening, a morning and an evening walk during the pandemic. And we live on 11 acres. And so I have my, my path that I go and just being able to notice the seasonal changes um, I've always, I'm a birder, so I've often known the birds, but I know them in a, a deeper way. Like right now, I know there's a cardinal on her second nest outside of my library window. I have a house finch on her third brood, you know, things, things that I'm really seeing. Um, and I, I think you're right that it is something about the quality of observation, the depth of perception that we were able to sink into. Um, and and it, it will be really interesting to see how that changes things for us as writers, but also this younger generation. I think these conditions, mm -hmm. um, plus the existential threat of climate change that they're seeing right now is affecting our younger mm -hmm. people. I mean, are you seeing that come up in, in just your student population or, or younger writers that you might work with or writers at all? I, I absolutely am. I don't see as much of, um, I think, a debate about it anymore. Um, I think I used to, I'd say five years ago, there was always a, a conversation about climate change in which people were disagreeing and, and having conversations. And, and I don't see that in fiction anymore. Um, this younger generation is much more, uh, not just aware, but educated, actually. Um, they've grown up with this in a, in a very different way. And so I do see that come out in their work. Um, and when I, when I find a Midwestern writer in my classroom, which is rare, um, it's a delight. Um, I'm also aware that that I do write about that landscape and that Midwestern literature is vibrant, it's necessary, but it's also um, 
not always valued in scholarship the same way, um, right? And so I also write about this downfall of kind of rugged individualism and um, that the dangers of that, of not understanding our, our complicated place in the natural world. Um, you probably see that tension, I would assume, in your students' work, but also I know you write about it as well. I, I, everything you just said, I would I would highlight with a yellow marker. Um, and I agree with wholeheartedly, uh, especially that sense of you know teaching in a New England um, elite space up here, you know, in Middlebury. When I do find a Southern student that reminds me of myself, it always is somewhat shocking when the accent is still noticeable or just the um, the sense of place. Uh, and even even my other students who didn't you know who grew up in Connecticut, I'll still have them read. Southern fiction, like Paget Powell or something like that, and um, but it is interesting to think about how to make space for these different places and people in these conversations, and how to nurture writers that are coming up with mm -hmm. those perspectives. So mm -hmm. I like hearing that you think about that too. I think so much of it is about exposure, right? That we don't really know each other's experiences because our country is so vast, but our our politics see more of a rural urban divide. And I have found that folks can be just as isolated in a city suburb, perhaps more so than sometimes, you know, and they can be just as worldly on a country road, that it's a matter of choosing to learn and to listen beyond our own comfort and being curious rather than, you know, rejecting something that, that immediately seems unfamiliar. And you mentioned earlier, Megan, this idea that that kind of fear drives that polarization. Um, I don't actually find that most Americans are on the extremes of these issues, but I find that the extremes are loud. Um, and so perhaps, yeah. What, I was going to say that's what I've heard as well. It's just that sometimes it's the denier or the strongest opinion that is the loudest voice in the room. That's something a lot of my um, guardian interviews used to say in the South, you know, just saying, uh, you know, these rural populations often get stereotyped as if they're this one voting block or ignorant or not educated on these issues of weather of climate change um and i completely agree with you that that's definitely one cannot assume that there's so much nuance um in these experiences and it's it's just nice to see them represented in nonfiction and fiction mm -hmm. i agree this has been fun it has so um anything else you want to add before i sort of close us out no this has been an absolute pleasure to spend this time with you and and talk. Yeah, same. Um, well, to the viewers, just thank you for joining us, um, Melissa and I, with our, our session, Weather Report. We're pleased that you gave us this time together, um, and I hope the discussion has been valuable to you. And please be sure to check out 1455 Literary Arts at 1455literarylitarts.org to learn more about the organization that sponsored this talk and the free programming offered throughout the year. So thank you, Melissa, and thank you again to all of our guests. Thank you. Bye-bye.